Buzz Chat. I'm talking today with Greg. Hello. Hey, Kristen. How are you? It's great to have you on. And I should say that, uh, so uh, Greg is also, uh, he's an MVP as well as a fellow uh, regional director. So a handful of RDs who have been in the program. But so Greg, for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? All right. So, uh, so yeah, a long-term data platform MVP, actually. Uh, So based out of Melbourne, Australia. Um, grew up in Brisbane, actually, in a different state. And so most of the time was there in uh, in a completely different state. But I married someone from Melbourne. <laughs> so I ended up in Melbourne. Uh, lived in the other parts of the country and things uh, along the way. But, uh, yeah, look, I, I love being in Australia. The uh, I basic background, I suppose, I, I did work as a developer uh, for, for a long time. Uh, I actually got into the industry so far back that I was working on initially learned coding on mainframes and you know, I was doing uh, and then I worked for HP actually doing maintenance on uh, minis and uh, things for a, a long time and uh, the, the, the thing I, I love you know like I, I don't reminisce about too many of the things about that time but uh, uh, the, the industry is very tame nowadays uh, but by comparison right uh, one of one of the things I, I used to say is I, I had a major respect for equipment that could physically harm you right <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. and uh, we don't tend nowadays to work on equipment you know people don't have equipment that can you know break their arms or you know think, things like that anymore or <laughs> you know and so on and uh, yeah it was it was kind of spectacular you know like uh, I I remember we had a series of disk drive that was like breaking people's arms and, you know, <laughs> you know and things. And, and uh, you'd work inside uh, some of these gigantic old printers. And it, it was like literally uh, being inside a box that you're working on with a chainsaw running beside your head. <laughs> you know, the, the, these sorts of things. It was uh, just remarkable uh, times you know, by, by comparison. So, yeah, no, no, that was... Uh, it's all fun, but yeah, then then ended up uh, running a software house for a long time and uh, learned a lot more about development and and uh, about creating products that uh, were supportable in the market. Uh, that was a a pretty key thing in amongst there. Uh, eventually, ended up um, I was doing I've been doing study on and off you know forever. I I, th- I think I was. Uh, externally at a uni or part-time or unis for about 21 years or something like that you know, along the way so it was, it was like a an endless thing that, that I was uh, doing various courses and things but um, once you got to sort of research type degrees and so on the wor- working at a university was a good place to be if you're studying at a university so yeah oh, so. oh for sure that's why a lot of uh, doctoral programs uh, will require you as part of your doctoral program. Uh, some schools, cause I, so I was going to pursue my doctorate. I should say that, you know, mm. uh, Greg also has a, a PhD as well. Well, I'll come mm. back to asking a question about that. But I was looking at one of the, uh, or a number of the programs that I looked at said, no, you cannot work. Like you have to be full-time. You actually have to teach. Now that they yeah. got a requirement in the programs, which, uh, it's, which- it's a success criteria, right? Mm. So if, if you look at, uh, when I when I started the uh, the completion rate for PhDs in general was about six percent, hmm. and so so small, right? And uh, people don't realise, you know, it's so many people start with great intentions and and life intervenes and and they just drop out. Um, no, they drop the, out so unsuccessful <laughs> sometimes with masters, only a masters, you know. Yeah, no, no. Um, at the time, <laughs> yeah. actually, at the time, people already had those to get yeah. into the program in the first yeah. place. So it wasn't like an alternate exit point or something like that. Um, but the completion rate for part time PhDs was about two or three <laughs> percent. Oh, and wow. so uh, I remember when I started. Uh, the dean of the faculty said, "Look, these these don't work, you know." And and I said, "No, no, no, I'll 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 finish it." You know? and, uh, and and in fact, I think I had many times I nearly stopped. And 
the only thing I think kept me going is I, I remember just wanting to prove to the dean that when I said I'd complete it, I, I really would complete it, right? And uh, but but the other problem with something part time is that it takes you so much longer. Mm. And if you think about um, in the case of PhD programs, you're trying to come up with something that are uh, things that are an original contribution to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if you think about things in this industry, uh, a lot changes in say you know, five or six or seven years uh, well, while not, you'd be doing that sort of program. It's, it's not just that. It's also, I mean, what we understand through mm -hmm. research that multitasking is pretty much a lie um, mm -hmm. that you can't divide yourself. It's like, look, you know, a man cannot serve two masters if you want to get religious about it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, 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 there is something to say about focusing on, on something and being dedicated to totally. it. Totally. So I totally, completely, totally. I, I completely get that. And the more you spread that out, it actually takes additional time to unplug from one thing, replug into another thing. Mm -hmm. And, and so having that focus time on, that one area like i look i if i won the lottery i would go back and get i would stop working and go get my phd mm -hmm. like i would mm -hmm. love to go and pursue that and do research and write and talk to people and just do nothing but interview and research and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. i would love that life fiscally yeah, it, look, was, it, it was it was me, interesting the 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 other thing that that used to happen is that people would start they'd be doing their own research topic and then there was very little educational involvement really. And then they would finish at some time later and submit and then do, you know, oral Hopefully defense and, you know, all, all, all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, but the, the, again, another success criteria is really that you're associated with a project where you have other people who are doing uh, similar work or research work at the same time. So, you're much more likely to be successful if you're doing one part of a project that other people are doing other parts of that same project. Right. Because you'll tend to drag each other along. Right. Rather than the original old thing where people just kind of, you know, joined up and then went dark for, yeah. for a long period of time. And so uh, I was actually doing work in, um, we had done uh, programming languages lab and Information Security Research Center, which was actually kind of early for uh, for that sort of thing at the the time I was doing that, but I was sort of jointly in, in both of those. And so um, we're actually uh, involved in a project where we're looking at building uh, secure execution modules for Windows NT actually at the time, mm -hmm. um, uh, early on. And so, um, because if you look at uh, the problem with a general purpose operating system is that there's a lot of clients who don't want a general purpose operating system. So they, they don't want an operating system that will just run a program that anybody wrote. They want an operating system that will only run programs that have gone through particular compilers, you know, digitally signed, you know, so right. on and so on and so on. Yeah. And so, uh, that, and that, that's actually a really good thing, of course, in terms of, you know, viruses and, you know, and so on and so on. So the, the, the there are still needs for various types of operating systems. And, and NT was designed to have multiple execution things inside it. So it had a Windows 3.1 execution environment. It had the, the NT one. It had a POSIX environment. It had, and so you could actually add additional ones in there and, have, uh, and disable other ones and so on. So you could actually kind of turn it into a different operating system or a much more restricted type of operating system and so anyway yeah so it was a sort of projects and around that sort of thing and uh no it was enjoyable actually it was good but yeah yeah took it's, a long time yeah it, you know <laughs> uh, well i mean so my I, so i had actually paused mine i uh, i i um paused my entry i lost my placement i would have to go back and reapply but mm. i was going to study the uh funny enough the uh given where the world has is evolved uh, uh, into technology has um, uh, into uh, social informatics, specifically mm. studying the impact of collaboration technology on working teams, teams of people. Yeah, the, there's that. so like, many of these areas. <laughs> it would, I mean, it just it was such a fascinating topic and would have been so relevant to what we're doing. You know, again, SharePoint guy, mm. you know, in this bit the collaboration well, space. But one one of one of the things I like now is I have a little more leeway to be able to 
uh, do things like I, I like to stay in touch with some of the unis and things like this, right? So, uh, so for example, there's Charles Sturt Uni in Wagga, actually out in the middle of the country here. But uh, uh, I, I did some study out of their Bathurst campus years ago. But anyway, I've, so I stayed in touch with the uni quite a bit. Actually, had got to uh, do a, the speech at their um, one of the graduation ceremonies a couple of years ago. Actually, that was fun. Um, but the if I look at, uh, they have a lot of people going through programs now and sort of doctoral equivalents or professional doctorate type, type programs. Uh, and so I like staying as an industry supervisor, as a volunteer associated with those sort of programs. And so the, uh, I, and you know, like for every every year they'll have a research symposium and I'll go along and spend a couple of days listening. And, and years ago when I used to go along, I, was almost quite depressing the, the the level of what was going on in the research and stuff. But uh, if I if I look at what I've seen in recent years, um, there's, there's some completely fascinating work that people are doing. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, just completely changed uh, you know, thinking in a number of areas. Like to give you an example, there was a guy who worked out uh, how to take his mobile phone and he could modify the modulate the Wi-Fi. Um, signal coming out of his phone to detect breathing and heartbeats at a, a distance from the phone. So he could literally take a phone, walk up to a door and tell you if there's somebody on the other side of the door or, you know, or things like that, or in a, an earthquake, which is topical uh, this week and so on. Now, often the only thing they have is, are the phones. Um, and he could find people under the rubble with a phone. Wow. You know, st stuff like that. No, no, just go like that. That's so cool, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and of course, being able then you say, well, hang on, if you get uh, a number of phones, can you then form an array and right. you know do a better job of, of finding people on rubble? Triangulate like, to find them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Like, so like this sort of stuff just goes on and on. And, and so I look at these things and it's completely and utterly fascinating now, some, some of the projects that are going on. Um, and the other thing I get involved with still is also uh, mentoring people going through these sort of programs. Um, and so, for example, I've got a, a, a mentee at the moment who's a, a biomed student, right? And uh, but, but again, the, the thing that's fascinating there is is more in the case of what he's doing. Like, I mean, I don't understand the biomed stuff that he's doing, um, but it's more helping him just get through the process, you know, of what he has to do to uh, to get to the other end, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so look, so I still have an involvement with that. It, it's yeah. It's just in in the background, but I, I yeah, I, I kind of love the fact that's all happening. Yeah, it's uh, so. And what was your? Uh, I guess we kind of skip past it too. Is that you know uh, you've been an MVP for over twenty years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. so I mean, what? I, I mean, I don't even know how big the program was back then. But what oh, so what kind of what was what was that process like? How how do you how does it compare to what people go through today to become an MVP? Look, I, I think. Still very similar in a lot of ways. I mean, they were awarding you. Uh, I, I suppose the important thing with the MVP program is it's an award for what you previously did, and uh, and that, I think that's something that people have, often don't understand the difference between that and the RD program. Where the, the RD program had forward commitments about what you would do, mm -hmm. the MVP program doesn't have that. So it's like you did all this stuff. You know, we give you this award. It lasts for a year. You don't have to do anything, right? If you don't do anything, we won't award you again next time. But <laughs> but, but there's nothing you actually have to do, right, uh, in that period. Whereas, and at the time uh, that I first uh, became part of that, I was actually uh, appointed into ADO.net, actually, curiously, which was the uh, an interesting sideline there. And then eventually, and then the following year, moved across into the SQL Server uh, side of things, and then somewhere along the way, they they uh, turned that into a data platform thing. Um, and as as the technologies have evolved and you know, spread out over the years, but the RD program, uh, I think the the thing that's important there is it uh, is more cross technology and business oriented. Uh, so if you look at most of the people in the RD program, they tend to be business owners or. Uh, yeah, that, that these sorts of people, or uh, they're involved in boards of corporations or or uh, government things, or you know, they run, have run on government boards or 
uh, companies and things. And so they usually have a, a pretty strong understanding of, of the business related aspect and they usually have a very broad technology focus. Uh, and many will be MVPs, so they also have a depth area uh, that they work in, but, but yeah, they, they tend to have a, a much more of a breadth. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's an interesting program. I, I think it's changed significantly over the years. <clears throat> Sorry, the, when I first joined, it was, it was the most amazing thing that I was involved with, right? Uh, every day there was an absolute torrent of email and stuff coming on the distribution list, right? I mean, you were talking significant volumes of, of things in amongst that. And it, it was the most inspiring thing that I would read every day. And it was funny as well. Like uh, the, uh, the jokes between the people on the, on the list and so on, it was just spectacular, right? Yeah. Um, I miss that. Yeah. You know, if I, if I look at the list nowadays, uh, there's a few, a few things maybe every day, about one or two things. It used to be a hundred things, you know, or more yeah. a day, right? And yep. and the the other thing I find with those sort of distribution lists is that what tends to happen over time is that you get people who want to listen in on those lists because it's so inspiring, but then they end up modifying the discussion on the list to make those people who are listening happy, and and you sort of kill the discussion that was actually going on on the list because you're trying to make those other people happy. Right. You know, and the a big mistake I see on a lot of the distribution lists right now is that uh, I, I know they're doing it with good intent where they're intending to try and cut down the email volumes and things like that. But what will happen is somebody will start a discussion and then immediately somebody from the product group or something will join into the discussion, but take the discussion offline somewhere else. Right. Yep. And the, the thing if, I look at with that don't is, know too, is like the one it was described to me when I joined. So I've been in for this will like five years because they kind of with mm -hmm. the pandemic, it got weird. It's supposed to be a two year uh, uh, yeah. position. But uh, it, it is that you know, the conversations were like a fast track to like the top 300 leaders across Microsoft. So you could ask a question to say, hey, I have this issue or I have this concern about this or I saw this new messaging and you'd have a president or vice president inside Microsoft mm -hmm. responding and then pulling in like directly to the thread and yeah. pulling in other people and taking action around that. But like you said, it, it's, I see more of now in the, in the DLs and there's, there's different mm -hmm. you know, a, a distribution lists for different discussion types. I, I actually prefer the one that it's the direct where it's just the RDs. I think you still mm -hmm. find some of the humor and, see, and, some and of the that's, discussion, that's, but... that's a really good example. Uh, something I don't really want to talk too much about, but the thing is the, you get to the point that, the, the real discussion moves to somewhere else uh, rather than on the thing where it was in the first place. Yeah. And the, but, but the, the sort of problem they've run into, it's the same in the MVP list is that I think they think they're doing the right thing when somebody from product group comes in and moves the discussion off somewhere else. But what they're missing is that all they're assuming that no one else on that list is interested in that discussion. And that's not true. There's a lot of lurking. There's a lot of sidebar <laughs> conversations based off of that discussion. And like, I, I look, I just, as I mentioned, I, I, you know, uh, supposed to be traveling to go to an RD meetup event next week. And a fellow RD and I were, uh, Sharon Weaver and I were chatting about something about a conversation that we saw on there. And we had mm -hmm. like something entirely, both of us talked about, well, we both need to get back on and comment and add it in, you know, add into that discussion. But it becomes the, the point of discussion, both business owners, both of us. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about the impact of that, of that topic. And it's, it's I mean, that's... But see, you, you also learn an enormous amount by watching through the discussion about how something gets solved. Yep. Right. You know, and, and, and so on, right? So the, the thing is, and that's the difference between someone who's embedded or just is, is in, so into the technology they will thrive even just watching and hearing somebody else right. getting to a resolution. The, the idea of having the discussion start disappear 
and then maybe come back right. with a bit of an answer. That's, that's, that's a completely different thing. You, you know, Greg, it's one of the reasons you just defined why for uh, 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 over 11 years. So we're in our 12th year now. I've been running mm -hmm. monthly tweet jams on mm -hmm. various topics. I started it because I wanted to get outside of my company's echo chamber on important yep. topics. I wanted to hear from, you know, public, anybody out there in the open. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a one hour event where there are seven questions that are asked. But what I love about it is that, and some people that are frustrated um, that don't do a lot on Twitter. And so they, it, mm. it's very fast paced. Yeah. And so if you're following, it's like, I find it really difficult to follow along. I said, yeah, but you know, it's Twitter. It'll like, you can go search from 12 <laughs> years right. ago and find the Twitter conversations. It's mm. all there. So afterwards, you can go back and follow the threads around the hashtag. Um, mm. For those that aren't familiar with that, it's the Collab Talk Tweet Jam. Uh, the next one is a, it's it's the at the end towards the end of every month. You can search for it on Twitter in the Collab Talk Collab Talk hashtag. You'll find all the discussions. But it is it's following along those things and and it sometimes spurs on there are people that do blog posts off of one side conversation that all happened in the public sphere around mm. the discussion it's and what i tell people i said if you're a content creator or you're a product owner or independent consultant like i i validate ideas from these kinds of conversations mm -hmm. i get ideas like i never thought of that perspective and correct get, I will then I'll find people that I'll reach out to. And I've done this through the RD conversations. I'll reach out to those people and say, Hey, that sounds like something my company is working on. Can we hmm. work together? Can we do these other things? Or have you thought about this? And so it's been, as you started out saying, it's very inspiring. A lot of those conversations. Um, to, to give to give an example as well. Like I, I used to, I got involved in user groups really early on. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, uh, if, if I look at that, um, we had a really good group in Brisbane. Uh, let, let, let's say like even the beginning of the .NET groups and things like that, right? I, I would attend every one of those, right? I mean, uh, regardless. And what was sort of interesting with that is it didn't matter what the topic was, I, w I would go, right? And so, like, I mean, I remember vividly uh, someone discussing, say, a MIDI interface for audio, right? Now, I mean, I had had some, you know, I've had a background playing in bands and things like that. So, I mean, the, the whole, you know, audio side of things, that, that's vaguely of interest, but the MIDI stuff, nah, never particularly interested me. However, watching the, the thing that he showed us it was the user interface that he had built. Hmm. Left me completely amazed. And, and I got so many ideas out of, out of that, unrelated to what he was talking about. And, and, and see, this is, this is the thing people often don't get about science and research and things like that as well to come around to that same topic, is that almost everything that is substantial uh, that has ever happened research-wise comes out of left field. It, it doesn't come out of where people are researching in the first place. No. And, and so you, you get, like, people say, well, like, why do we put money into, I don't know, astronomy or Something like that. I was talking know? about like <laughs> NASA, all of the billions of dollars that the U.S. spends for NASA, and people say it's like, why, why do we care about sending somebody to to Mars or to the mm -hmm. to the walk on the moon? Is because of the thousands of products and other ideas that came out of because of those mm -hmm. investments in that unrelated area. It gave us, you know, a, a knowledge of of different of plastics, uh, for example, a lot of plastics. A, a great today. example is, uh, say, things like MRIs, right? Um, the real origins of most of that came out of an astronomer, yeah. you know, noticing an effect while looking at, at, at galaxy stuff, you know what I mean? Then there was, you know, US Navy stuff in around that too. I mean, a bunch of things, but, but there was a real spark occurred there through somebody noticing something in a totally different field of science. Yeah. You, you just, you can't pick it. And it's a mistake that governments make all the time is that they, they always assume that if you get the best people in a particular area and you keep putting money into that same thing and focusing on that, you'll get the best outcome, but you won't, right? It, yeah. it, it, it's a bit like, if I look at medical research, you have all these people who largely come from the same background, 
who are educated the same way and they're all trying to solve these intractable problems, right? And I really, really wish they would pick up a bunch of civil engineers and <laughs> you know, pe people from totally different areas who might just look at that problem <laughs> you know, in, a, in a way that you were not thinking about, right? Well, that, that's one of the most important, uh, my first company mm -hmm. that I started during my master's program um, uh, with uh, two, two fellow, you know, two classmates and we created mm -hmm. a company and we were creating a product. And one of our advisors, we were, we were stuck at a certain point. And one of our advisors to this, because we were doing it for the schoolwork for, you know, initially it was, you know, theoretical, we're talking about this. And we said, we have an actual idea, let's go do this. But about a year into it, you know, one of the, one of the professors, or that was one of our advisors said, are you in business to create that thing? Or are you in business to, to solve certain problems, whether it's that thing or it's something that that leads you mm -hmm. towards. And so we learned about, you know, the whole pivot, you know, mm -hmm. pivot the business. We took totally. that learning and totally. we, went, we went, went from a hardware to a software solution and two and a half years later sold the company. Um, you know, we, we created in some the, value. In the, in the software house that I, I was running in Brisbane in the, uh, the late, uh, all through the nineties, basically late eighties and nineties, the, uh, I had a guy who was uh, a fellow director, but he was uh, doing more the sales and marketing side of things, right? But the thing I loved about him is that if I had a technical problem that I was struggling to solve, he would not know what to do with the technical problem. But he was the best person I've ever struck in terms of asking me questions that led me to the answer. Hmm. You know? The great skill set, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, there's a skill set there that is is extraordinary, and uh, um, but but it's even a bit like I look at say things like troubleshooting. And when I first started at HP, one of the the things they did is they shipped us off to the US. And one one of the courses we did at the time was a a Kepner Trigo one or something. It was like logical troubleshooting. But but what I noticed at the end of that course is that still really the people who could troubleshoot at the beginning of the course were the same people who could troubleshoot at the end of the course. You know, like I. And, and I think that is really not, not saying you can't teach someone to troubleshoot, but you, you're diving back further where you need to teach them to think logically, you know, and, and that's, that's a tough, tough call. You know, you, that's not something you can, you know, I, I look at, say, something like uh, the popularity of the Da Vinci Code, the book, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the whole way through, it's just full of logical nonsense, you know, where they'll go, look, you know, A could cause B. Oh, we know B is true. So, well, A must have been true. And you go, no. <laughs> you know, right. There's an enormous number of other reasons why B might have been true, right? Yeah. And and yet it's it's like one after the other, the entire book. I, I got to the point, I, I, it wasn't that it was a horrible book, but, you know, it, just that logical nonsense that followed all the way through it was way too much for my head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yet I see people who just think that all the time. Yeah. Now it, it's how they think, you know, and you just think, oh, you know, this is true. And, you know, then, oh, well, you know, that causes that. And, you know, if that's true, well, that must be true. Uh, no, no, <laughs> that isn't how it works. Well, <laughs> yeah. I think they're there. Yeah. Hey, we could have a long, much longer conversation around, uh, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, the, the world treats, you know, the, the, you know, science and research and, mm. Uh, yeah, so it's a it's a painful thing to watch in real time. Uh, some of the discussion, but, but it's important, as I said, like troubleshooting you to be able to at least even apply a sort of a a binary division. You know, the whole way along. You know, like you know, let's establish it's one of these two things. You know, then we get then we cut it down to this, and then we know one of the others and things, and then we cut it down to the next thing, and we just keep going. So we get to the small pool of things that could possibly be the answer. But but I see people who do troubleshooting and they're just all over the place, right? And and, and it's because they're not applying a sort of a logical breakdown to to the evidence they're seeing in front of them. And, yeah. Uh, well, that's actually a, 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 fa a favorite line I had from a, uh, an old engineer that I learned a lot from um, when I started at HP. Uh, I loved his line. He used to say, "The more smoke and flames, the better." Right, and uh, mm. and and he was right because 
with smoke and flames, you know where the problem is, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, so. I have to ask, so when you traveled over, did you were you in Palo Alto or did, that you visited? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I uh, actually met both uh, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. Uh, oh, wow. Years ago, yes. <laughs> I, uh, it's it's so strange, actually. Over the years, I've, I've met a lot of these uh, people. <laughs> when, when did you When did you leave HP? Uh, I left in eighty six. Okay, there. I think. And uh, I was uh, yeah started in eighty one. And first trip I did to the US, I was here uh, there for oh I think probably about three and a half months or four months or something. And yeah, and and so the first couple of weeks we we're at the Palo Alto headquarters and. Uh, uh, I was living uh, down in San Jose and uh, mm -hmm. doing most of the work in Cupertino area. And uh, I, I was uh, born and, and raised in the area. <laughs> I, was born, I was born and raised there, but I, I worked for HP for uh, in 2003, 2004. So no overlap. Yeah. There, but but look, out, it, out of it, headquarters it, there and, and right off of Page Mill Road. Hmm. And... Look, if, back in the day, uh, both Bill and Dave were still around. Right uh, at at the time, but they were uh, they weren't involved day to day, you know, at at that at that point. So uh, John Young had taken over; they put him in place as the company president at the time. And uh, but I, I happened to be in a couple of spots, like I was in Palo Alto when they had a shareholders meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the I don't know if you in HP in those days, uh, the color of your name tag was actually really, really important because that, that determined a lot of things, right? Mm. So being an Australian, we had a green name tag with, with yellow writing. The, the US ones were, you know, different colors and so on. And like I had, you know, Japanese friends with red ones and so on and all this. But um, uh, it was sort of interesting. Like we were in Palo Alto and all these dudes come in who had gold name tags. <laughs> and you go, huh, oh, okay. Then you suddenly realize, like, because uh, they were there for a shareholders meeting, and uh, like, these are all the people you've read about in HP magazine. <laughs> they, yeah. they were all the people that were there for the shareholders meeting and stuff. And yeah, it was completely fascinating. And Dave Packard came around and, uh, yeah, made a point of meeting our group and stuff and talking to us for it. Was, it was completely fascinating. And uh, the, um, and of course, he gravitated immediately to people with different colored name tags. So, you know, that's, yeah. we got to spend more time with him. And, uh, but um, the, the other one was Bill Hewlett. You know, he did the whole, you know, the, the, the typical, I remember one of the sales guys calling him Mr. Hewlett, and he did the whole, you know, I'm Bill. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Mr. Hewlett was my dad sort of thing. The, um, they, they were very down to earth guys, you know, like uh, that, that's the thing that uh, impressed me a lot with them. The, um, uh, yeah, I found them just completely fascinating guys. But the, uh, yeah, it was a sort of an interesting time in the company back then because it was a heyday of the industry. Oh, yeah. like, and in the Bay Area, for example, uh, Sugar, the four company prior to Seagate, right, for example, yep. uh, were running ads on TV at night, every night, t trying to get people to come and work for them. Yep. You know, stuff like this. They had fully staged ads with, you know, the Sugar Express and, you know, like... Uh, it, we had um, uh, we were staying in a garden apartment complex down in uh, San Jose area, and HP had a block booking on about 150 of the apartments, right? Mm -hmm. And several nights while we were staying there, we had recruiters just come cold calling at night, just knocking on the door, just saying, "Do you want a job?" You know, like a, it, it was like the most remarkable time in the industry. It was it really was quite strange. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, again, having, uh, you know, uh, you know, growing up in the Bay Area, and so a lot of my friends, their parents worked down in Silicon Valley. And I, I grew up in the East, mm -hmm. over the East Bay, but I, I worked there for years, moved back, uh, moved away to Sacramento, moved back down to the Bay Area and commuted down there. But the HP culture was fantastic. In fact, um, they, mm -hmm. I was invited to stay to continue. I was consulting there. And, 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 but we left then the, the state, we wanted out of California altogether, mm. but um, otherwise I would, uh, you know, who knows, still be with HP today. I really like the culture. Yeah, they, I, I loved, I loved the corporate culture. It was almost uh, at the early stage there, it was so, it was almost overwhelmingly, almost smothering actually a, a bit in some ways, but um, I, yeah, the, the, the culture of the place was extraordinary. I, in later years, I did. I watched the change of leadership and things and stuff. And yeah, I was there you know, when you know, you know, I, Carly Fiorina, Carly Fiorina came in. Yeah, yeah, so, I, yeah. 
it, look, I think she got kind of a you know harsh story. There was some of the change that had to happen and with the yeah. board and everything around that. But it was, so I'm a collaboration technology guy. I was mm-hmm. there helping build out and deploy a collaboration platform. Uh, the Keychain Initiative was my project mm-hmm. and, uh, that I was on. And, and uh, you know, that aspect of it, um, the the daily, you know, the, the voices over the, the intercom of that, the team, the way that, that people worked, it was just very again very collaborative it was mm. very much a we're a team going and doing these things our our uh, objectives are sh- these shared objectives and we we i had a clear idea of what i was working on individually how mm. that fit into a team and when anyway i mean again we can have a longer conversation yeah, absolutely. about that but it's a uh hopefully Look, we'll... the, the thing I, I loved with the company at the stage i started in 81 they were they made all these things themselves too, right? Yeah. What one of the big things that changes by start to change by the time I left actually in, in mid eighties is they had started to just buy equipment from other people and rebadge it, right? And so on. The engineering that went into the products prior to that uh, was nothing like I've ever seen anywhere in the industry ever, you know, before or since. You know, they 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 simply did the best engineering in the industry and. Uh, um, I mean, to give you that, you talk about PhD programs. We had, a, I remember the 7935 disk drive uh, appeared and there was a, there was something like four or five guys doing PhDs on bits of things in that drive. You know, I mean, there, there was one who did it on the plastics design. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was so advanced, you know, like, I mean, who does that, you know, on the plastics yeah. design of a disk drive, right? Uh, the, the level of engineering that went into the products in those days, uh, nothing I've, I've never seen anything like that since you know uh, yeah. in anything that's yeah. well my my first tech job uh 91 92 was with uh we actually ran hewlett packard's reclamation site uh mm. so we staffed it and we did it and we resold all the used globally for hp so if, like if you bought mm-hmm. a monitor and there was a scratch in it and took it back they would ship it back to Rockland, California, which is just outside of Sacramento. Yep. I know the Rockland it division. Yeah. Our, it, yeah, out there now. It used to be the Stanford Ranch. It was way out there in the middle mm-hmm. of nowhere. It's now an ocean of homes all around the HP. Yep. Facility, but um, but I, anyway. I, I met at, at one of the Friday beer busts that every division pretty much, like there was always somebody having one around that area The uh, every week, actually. I met a, a woman from uh, the terminals division and uh, she, she's always struck me as someone who'd worked in the one job probably a little too long, right? I mean, she could walk up to a dumb green screen terminal, uh, you know, which internally was firmware controlled and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And she could just start typing on the keyboard uh, and open up things that would download instructions into the terminal, dumb terminal. And then she could just buy from rote memory, type in enough code to start playing a car game on the screen of the dumb terminal. And I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> like, like, it's been in that division just a little too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, something to be said about uh, liking your job and you know, have some security there. Yeah, cool. like, I mean, this, the machine language uh, required for, for inside a green screen terminal is, is just getting pretty esoteric. Yeah. yeah so. Well, Greg, hey, I really appreciate your time and getting to chat. And All hopefully- good, man. Now that events are starting to open up again, maybe we'll see each other at a future uh, MVP or RD along event. The yeah, yeah. So, Greg, for folks that want to find you, what are the base, best ways to reach you to find you online? Uh, Greg at sqldownunder.com. Uh, most basic, or just go to sqldownunder.com. Reach out. Mm. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. For oh, your we've time. also now got yeah. Cosmos downunder.com as well uh, okay. which is all focused on cosmos db so yeah that's you got that one. is that within your mvp profile as well that link yep that? all right i'll grab it or all. it will be will be if it's not there already excellent well thanks a lot for your time greg and uh thanks for sharing part of your saturday all good <laughs>